happy man. Used to sing the song, the B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. And uh, we shouldn't stop singing it, should we? Need to sing it, need that reminder. We certainly need the B-I-B-L-E. Amen. Thank you for the singing and the music this morning. And uh, I do have a little card here that says the board of directors will be meeting in the fellowship hall after the service. So if you're on the board of directors, you uh, need to be in the fellowship hall right after service to do that, okay? All right. Well, I want you to take your Bibles again and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. We've been here a couple of Sundays. I believe this will be the third Sunday uh, in this passage of Scripture. Uh, We're looking at the gospel. We have covered the law and the purpose of the law, and we've been talking about all the great effects of the gospel. And then we've been looking at this gospel preacher, the Apostle Paul, how that uh, he, he got the gospel. He told that he didn't get it from man, but he got it from God. And how God had met with him there in the desert in First Galatians chapter, Galatians chapter 1. We were looking at that last week. So today I'm going to tell you what the gospel is. I'm going to tell you exactly what the gospel is, okay? Uh, I've stalled as long as I can. I've run out of anything else to preach, so I'm going to have to get there now. So we'll find out what the gospel is. I'm sure that you know that. Uh, probably everyone in the building here knows what the gospel is, but we'll look at that in just a moment. Uh, I'm going to read verse 1 through 4 here again quickly, and then we'll go on to the message. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preach unto you, which ye also have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The Scriptures. Uh, We last week looked at uh, some information concerning the gospel, and of course we were looking at Paul's life. When I think about the Apostle Paul, and I think about his ministry, when Paul took the gospel to the Gentiles, they all had religion already. Uh, In fact, I don't know if atheism was not a popular thing. Uh, in Paul's day. Uh, even the Bible itself says that a fool is said in his heart, there is no God. Now, I can't explain God, but I can't explain creation. And you can't explain creation without God. As advanced as everything is, it took a creator to design and to create creation like God did. So Paul never had much dealings with atheists, I wouldn't think. But everywhere Paul did go, there was religious people. Some of those people were Jews, but they had religion only. Some of those people made up all kinds of religion. In Acts chapter 17, verse 16 through verse number 34, Paul was at Mars Hill. And while he was there, he he seen the inscription, I believe it was on an altar, said, to the unknown God. That's the kind of people Paul ran up with. They they believed there was a God, they just didn't know who who God was, and they'd come up with their own gods. Acts 17, Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 32, Paul talks about those who used to know God, but they turned from God, and then they began, as time went on, making gods out of things that God created, out of wood and stone, and how that life went downhill. They they believed that there was a God, and they were making idols to their gods. Even in 1 Corinthians chapter number 8, the Corinthian people had their gods. They had those temples up there on the hillside where they went and offered meats unto their gods. So they were not atheists, they believed in gods. You know the amazing thing about it, in James, 
chapter number 2, verse number 19 says that the Bible, the, excuse me, the devil believes there's a God and trembles. What about that? That's a kind of an amazing verse, isn't it? That, that makes you think. Is the devil saved? No. Will he ever be saved? No. But he believes there's a God. That's more than what some people want to claim that they believe today. Revelation chapter 13, which is future, there will be a time that uh, the Antichrist and, and the beast begin to do all these signs and wonders and people begin to worship them as their gods. So Paul was not dealing with people who claimed that there was no God. He was dealing with people who were worshiping all kinds of God. And that brings me to a thing that I have heard said often down through the years. I've heard a lot of people with good intentions, I guess, say this. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe. Now, I hope I've already refuted that in what I've already said. It does matter what we believe. When Jesus came to this earth and walked on this earth with His disciples, He was teaching them truth because we need truth. He didn't tell the disciples, it doesn't really matter what y'all believe, let's just go fishing every day, buddy. No, He trained them and He taught them because we must believe right. So Jesus never taught that. Paul never taught that. Why, he wouldn't have had to wrote all those epistles. He wouldn't have had to went to all those meetings of, of, of teaching and preaching. If it didn't matter what you believed, why did Jesus do what he did? And why did Paul do what he did? But you know, even this book that we call the Bible tells us better than that. We must know truth. We must have truth. Truth. Paul writes in Romans chapter 10, verse 13 and 15, How beautiful are the feet of those that bring the gospel tidings, the glad tidings, uh, the gospel of the peace that you can have with God. Paul said, How beautiful are their feet because they bring you the truth, the truth that can set you free from sin and bring you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. So last week we were looking at some information concerning the gospel. This morning I want to say something, first of all, and then we're going to be there, I want to say something about the observation, the observation concerning the gospel. Verse number 3, Paul says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to Scriptures. Now, the gospel is in these two verses. But I want you to notice in verse number 3, we have the name Christ, or the title Christ. But then we go on in verse number 3, how that Christ died for our sins. Verse number 4, it says that he was buried. Now, who is he? That's Christ, back in verse 3. And then in verse number 4, he says, And that He rose again the third day. So in two verses, we have the gospel. But three times, three times, we have the mention of the Son of God. Once, He is referred to as Christ. Twice, He is referred to as He. Verse 3 and 4. So that tells me that whatever the gospel is, Christ is the centerpiece of the gospel. The gospel is in three and four. Christ is in three and four three different times. He is the centerpiece of the gospel. Whatever this gospel is, Christ, our faith is to be in Christ. We could say that He has become the predominant one in our lives. He has become number one in our lives when we have understood the gospel and that we have, uh, have, have opened up our heart to the gospel and allowed God to save us. Christ becomes the predominant one in our lives. I just held a funeral for a lady 
a woman a couple of weeks back, and, and in that, when I went by the house and spoke to her husband, he said, besides God, she's the best thing that ever happened to me. Had a wonderful Christian wife who had been a blessing, been married 55 years. God, after they were married, God saved him, and then God had saved her, and she had made him such a wonderful wife, but he didn't say, my wife is the best thing that ever happened to me. She is the predominant one in my life. No, he said, Jesus was the predominant one. He's the best thing that's ever happened to me. That marriage probably would have never worked without Christ. Pots and pans may have been flying through the kitchen had they not been for Christ. So he knew that it was because of Christ they had that special marriage. And Paul here mentioning Christ or referring to Christ three times lets us know that he is the predominant one. Our faith must be in Christ. Whatever the gospel is, Christ is the heartbeat. He's the center of the gospel. Not only do I think about that our faith must be in Christ, but I believe that our focus must be on Christ. For three times in these two verses, we are taught to look toward Christ. See what Christ did. See what Christ did. Our faith is in Christ. Our focus is on Christ. He becomes the uh, the predominant one in our lives, but He also becomes the priority in our lives. I care nothing about living for Christ and reading the Bible and Sunday school and church. I I cared for nothing about that until I got saved. But after I got saved, Christ became the priority in my life. I wanted to do what He wanted me to do. I wanted to please Him in what I did, where I go, how I talked, how I did, whatever it was. I wanted to please Him because He became predominant in my life. He was the priority in my life. I knew that if I I walked with God and I served Him and I, I lived with Him and grew in that relationship with Him, it would be the best life that you could ever have in this world. Three times in two verses. Our faith must be in Christ. Our focus must be upon Christ. And our future one day will be with Christ. He receives praise throughout our lives. It's amazing, it's interesting to me that the very last verse in this chapter, verse number 58, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. When we got saved... We, are, we put our faith in Christ. He has become the focus of our lives. And we know that even death cannot stop what we have. We have a future with Christ. So the Son of God, the Son of God is mentioned three times. That, that tells me that whatever the gospel is, it surely is centering around Christ. But not only do I notice the Son of God in those two verses, but I want you to notice the Word of God. Twice, twice, we are told in this passage of Scripture, look in the latter part of verse number 3, according to the Scriptures. Verse number 4, according to the Scriptures. Christ is seen three times. The Scriptures are, 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 are recorded as being said here on two different occasions. So not only is when we, whatever the gospel is, uh, it's going to make a big deal out of the Son of God, but it's going to also make a big deal out of the Word of God. The Word of God and the Son of God, they go together. Read John chapter number 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Son of God and the Word of God, they go together. You see, the the Word of God becomes a priority in our lives too because it's this Word that has led us to Christ. Up yonder on Mars Hill, they didn't get led to Christ through what they were reading in word of mouth. What they were doing was worshiping all kinds of stars and unknown gods. And go through there to Corinth, up there on that hill. They weren't doing that because of a Bible. I tell you, Paul brought them the Word of God, and it was the Word of God that led them to Jesus Christ. I don't know where you got saved or when you got saved, but I will tell you this. Somewhere in the background was working the Word of God. You had heard it somewhere. 
somewhere, sometime. Maybe you, you got heard a preacher preach one Sunday morning and got under conviction and got saved. Maybe a revival meeting. Uh, maybe down at the school. Maybe a Gideon Bible. I don't know how it happened. But God's Word is in there somewhere because it has a very vital role in us coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. They have, they have led us to Christ. And then they are longed for by Christians. When this book has brought us to the knowledge of truth, when this blessed book has brought us to Jesus Christ, and then not only do we trust the Lord Jesus and our life is changed and we know that it's real, we have a longing for this book. I, the Bible, even Paul, I believe it was to the, the people at Corinth, said that we ought to desire the Word of God as a baby does its mother's milk. I mean, throughout the day, that little baby wants more, and it wants more, and it wants more, and more. And that ought to be the way with us as Christians. It's this blessed book, it's the Scriptures that has revealed our need for Christ. It has revealed what Christ has done to meet that need. So this book has led us to Christ, but now we have a longing. We long for this book, to learn this book, and to grow in the Word of God. I believe that that just comes, you know, years ago when you went to buy a car, oftentimes you, you, could, you could choose a package, a package, you know, and then you'd order the car. But I don't think they do that. Now, you may be some stipulations and some of that, but most of the time you buy the car like it is. They've already thrown it together. Now, they may make different models in it, and you can choose that model. But today, you know, saying, well, I, you know, I don't want the AC. I don't know who would say that, but they, some people might. You know, I don't want the AC and I, this, that, and that. You get it as it is. They're on the lot, and you get it most of the time as it is. And that's the way it is with, with salvation. We get it as it is. When we come to Christ, it is the Scriptures that have led us to Christ. There ought to be a longing in our hearts for the Word of God. And it's this blessed book that is leading us to maternity, uh, to maturity, not maternity, maturity. It's this book, this Word of God, that is leading us to maturity. So you see, the, the Word of God has priority in salvation. And the Son of God has priority. In salvation. So last Sunday, Paul gave us the revelation. I had just a little observation that the Son of God and the Word of God are have a big, important part in this thing called the gospel. So let me say, lastly, the declaration. The declaration of the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, look in verse number 3. He died. That's the first step of the gospel, isn't it? That Jesus died. Christ died. Not only did He just die, but He died according to the Scriptures. So the declaration of the gospel is that He died. But now look a little closer at that little word right after died. It is for. He died for. Now if you had erased that little R and put the... O before the F, it would be of. He died of. But Christ did not die of something. He died for something. And that's important because that tells us that His death was a predetermined death. He didn't get sick one day. And they didn't call the doctor out. And the doctor come and shook his head and said, No, we've been seeing this all over town. And people have fallen over dead with it. And I believe that's what he's got. There's no hope. No, no. He didn't die of sickness. Nor did he die of an accident. Probably on the day that Christ was crucified on the cross, there were many people around Jerusalem. Maybe it fell off of a wall, got ran over by a wagon, stomped by a bull or something. They died of accident. There were many that day probably died from sickness, but not Christ. His death was a predetermined death. For Paul said he died for something. It's not sickness. It's not an accident, but it was providence. Christ come into this world, and you know and I know that He come into this world to die, as Paul states in verse 3, for our sins. So His death was a pre 
determined death. His death also, I believe we could say, there was a purpose in his death. My sin and your sin. When Christ died on the cross, Christ died taking my sin upon him. You say, well, now, preacher, how, how, how can we know that it works? I'm speaking from a, a lost person's view, not a saved person, because we that have been saved, we have experienced the, eternal, the life of eternal power. We know what it is to have the Spirit of God to help us. We know what it is to have fellowship with God. But a lost person might look at that and say, yeah, but how do you know that he was able to do that on Calvary? What makes you think that'll work? Well, the Bible said that he died for our sin. You know what the Bible says? The wages of sin is death. You know why we're going to die? You know why these bodies are going to give out and die? We're going to die because of sin. We're sinners. We have that sin nature on us. But Christ had never sinned. Christ had never sinned. He never said a dirty word. He never had a bad thought. He never cheated nobody out of anything. He had kept the law to the fullest extent. He had never sinned. And you know what? He could have never died. You cannot die unless there's sin. Sin brings death. Christ brings life. He could have never died on that cross. They could have thonged Him and progged Him and beat Him, suffocated. They could have done anything they wanted to, tried everything. But you can't die Unless there's sin. There must be sin. And the Bible said that He died for our sin. Why do I know that it worked on the cross? Because they couldn't have crucified Him. Christ could have just come down off of that cross and walked away. But He didn't. He didn't do that. He took my sin, your sin. And He could die when He took our sin upon Him. He died. It was a predetermined death. There was a purpose in his death. But then there's also all those prophecies about his death. Throughout the Old Testament, over and over again, we see that Christ was going to die. We see it in the pictures of the tabernacle. We see it in the offering of the sacrifices. We see it over and over throughout the Old Testament that Christ died. You know what? God said he was going to die. Jesus himself said that he was going to die. The disciples knew that he died. His mother knew that he died. Even the religious leaders knew that he died. Christ died on the cross. You know what happens when someone dies? We bury them, don't we? Well, the Bible says in verse number 3 that he died according to Scriptures and that he was buried. Now, this burial, burial has to do with the re results of the crucifixion. You've probably heard it. I've heard it. How some people say that he was just unconscious. You know, they didn't have a stethoscope and they didn't know where the pulse things was. And all. A lot of people, you know, come up with all that kind of unbelievers, skeptics, agnostics. They come up with all that kind of He wasn't really dead. Oh, yes, he was. Even his enemies admit that he was dead when they put the soldiers around the tomb. So everybody, everybody knew that Christ had died. He was dead. That was the results of the crucifixion. He had took our sins upon himself, and he died. But then there's the reports after the crucifixion. There was a guy, I think, by the name of Lee Strobel, I believe was his name, and he was a lawyer. And he wrote these books, A Case for Christ, and he wrote all these. He was a, a supposedly an atheist, and then he read the Bible through, and during that time he became a Christian, and he took all uh, his lawyer training and applied like the crucifixion and the resurrection and the birth and all these things about Christ and, and how that in a court of law there was nobody could say that it never happened. I mean, even his enemies, when they went to Pilate and said, let's put us a, a guard of soldiers around this tomb unless they come and steal his body, they're saying, we know he's dead. 
We know he's dead. This is just not the disciples. This is not just his mama. This is not some, a few people that was taking his place. But this was people that despised him. They said that he was dead. And Paul said that he died for our sins and he was buried. So Christ has died and he was buried. So there's the response also. They took down his body. They anointed his body. They wrapped his body. And then they entombed his body. So Christ has died. The Emmaus disciples, they knew that he had died. They were all broken hearted, but they knew that he had died. But Paul didn't leave us there. He goes on in verse number 4 and said that he rose again the third day. He rose again. You say, well, what good is a dead Savior? Not no good at all. Well, what is it about a living Savior? Well, that just proved He was God. He died on that cross for our sins. That he got up. He is the first fruits of those that have been placed into the ground. Look in verse 5 through verse number 8. Paul says that he was seen of Cephas. We know him mostly by Peter. But then he was seen of the twelve, and that, of course that's not counting Judah. That's just the, what they called that group of men, the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. How could you pull that off? How could you pull that off? He was seen of above 500 brethren at once, and of the greater part remain under this present. But some have fallen asleep. Paul said out of those 500 brethren that saw Christ, that crucified Lord that died for our sins, that got up on that third day, there are most of them still living. 500 at one time. Isn't that amazing? After that, he was seen of James, and then all of the apostles. And then Paul himself, in verse number 8, says, And last of all, he was seen of me as one born out of due time. There's the proof of the resurrection. They saw him. You remember when Christ uh, arose from the grave, there was a point when he had to enter into the heavens. He said, touch me not. But then he come back to earth. And then he told Thomas, said, you can touch me. But during all that time, there was like a 40-day period period that Jesus Christ was right here walking upon this earth. He died for our sins. He was buried, but Paul said he rose again. He gives us the proof in verse 5 through verse number 8. If you look in verse number 9 through 11, he gives us a product of the resurrection. Paul talks in verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul could have never changed his life. Paul could have never changed his lifestyle. He could have never changed his thoughts. Paul could have never became the man that he was had it not been for the grace of God and that resurrected Christ. It was that ministry, that Christ, that changed Paul's life. If you'll look in verse 12 through verse number 19 of this same chapter, Paul says, well, if Christ didn't get up, we're wasting our time preaching. If Christ did not get up, we're all in our sins. We're still sinners. Paul says that we might as well just quit doing anything because we're still nobody. But Paul lets us know on down in verse 20 through 22, He got up. He got up. For as in Adam all die, even so Christ shall be made alive. Every man in his order, Christ the firstfruits, and after they that are his at Christ's. Coming. So what is the gospel? Probably nobody in this building has learned anything this morning. The gospel is that Christ died, not accidentally, but on purpose for our sins. Through the first Adam that we studied in the adult classes this morning in Sunday school, the first Adam all died, but the last Adam, not the second Adam, but the last Adam, are all made alive. Now, that you can't get that in the temples up there offering meat to things you don't even know what you're really offering to. And you can't get that when you're 
out here in the jungles and you're, you're worshiping all this, that, and the other. It only comes through the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. He, he died for our sins. Nothing else is going to work. It amazes me when I, I talk to people and I say, all right, tell me about your salvation. And they can talk on and on and never mention Christ. On and on and never mention Scripture. Where Paul says that Christ three times and the Scriptures twice. Folks, listen. Christ died for our sins and nothing else will work. I don't know if I've mentioned it here or not, but they used to hear those songs on country radio when I used to listen to it a whole lot about taking this old, old fella down there, been lived bad all of his life. He was a drunk, beat his wife and stole him. I don't know what all he did. But they put him down in the river and they'd baptize him and even the fish down the river died because he was so dirty and filthy. There ain't none of that, are there? There ain't nothing for that. Salvation is in Christ, and Christ alone, according to the Scriptures. According to the Scriptures, Christ died for our sins. If they would have been any other way, it would have never happened that way. But Christ died for our sins. But the third day, a picture of Jonah in the Old Testament, our Lord comes up out of the ground. And even though they've got a guard around that tomb, and even though they've tried to do everything, thought they had their I's dotted, their T's crossed, their bases covered, they thought it was foolproof. He got up that Easter morning. That's the gospel. The power of God to change us. To get us out of our sinfulness and our selfishness. And to get us to a humbleness of Jesus Christ to take us from our fleshly ways and put us on a journey of faith there ain't nothing else will work does it matter what you believe oh yes it does matter there's lots of people today that'll die trusting baptism alone they were baptized when they were a child. They were baptized after they uh, went up front and made a profession of faith. What, the baptism. In fact, right after, right behind this, I plan on preaching at least one Sunday just on baptism. But I don't, I don't know at the times that I have talked to people and asked them about their salvation, and they, they never say anything about sin. They never say anything about Christ. They never mention scriptures. They never mention the blood. But the, about the first thing, if they ever get to anything, it's the baptism. Oh, yes, I'm saved because I was baptized. Do you think Jesus Christ would have had to come to this earth, live the life that he lived, Died the death that he died, taking our sins upon him, if baptism could get us into heaven. But there are multitudes of people today that are going into eternity, not knowing anything about the gospel, but yet trusting in baptism, church membership, good deeds, and all of that. Paul didn't go down there teaching that, but what he did, he said, I want to tell you what a work. Christ died for your sins. Christ was buried. He was dead. But the grave couldn't hold him. He got up. And through the power of the gospel, the Holy Spirit working in hearts and in lives, our lives are changed. And we got up when he got up. And now we can live a life of God consciousness, godly expectations, a life looking for Christ to return at any day. A life that if we do something wrong, it offends us deeply. I don't know if I ever told you or not, and I'm done, I'm, I'm quitting. My landing gear is coming down. But I'll never forget the, the guy that was at Idle Hospital for years and years. I think I told Anna Jean about this. I don't think I mentioned it here, but anyway... He, he told, I was talking to him at uh, CCU years ago. He's not up there now, but years ago I was talking with him. And uh, he was talking about when he got saved. He was like in his 20s when he got saved. And he said that uh, not long after he got saved, it had only been a month or so or just a short amount of time, and said he was walking down the road on a hot day and one of his buddies that he used to run around with pulled up 
and said, you want a ride? He said, sure. So he jumped in the car. Says, buddy, reached around the back and got a beer out of the cooler and handed it to him. Said, here's a beer. He said, he just popped it up. That's what they always did. And said, he turned that thing up, drunk about five big swallows. And he said, about that time, he said, I felt like I was a it on Jesus. That's the way it ought to be, isn't it? That's that when we don't do right, it offend us. Whatever it is. It's offensive and it hurts. And even our convictions, we got to stand on our convicting ground because we want to honor Him. And I couldn't do that without a resurrected Savior who has the power to save and the power to change and make us different creatures. That's the gospel. There's more to it than just the words. I want to look at that probably a couple of Sundays down the road. But there's something called the gospel miracle. There's a message. I've shared the message of the gospel. But there's also the miracle behind the gospel. And I think that's what we're really losing today. We need the power of God in the gospel. It's not just enough to walk up to somebody and say, you know, Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again, and they get saved. There's got to be a miracle. There's got to be something in the background that makes it work. And I'm glad the Bible tells us about that too. Ask Brother Matt, if you will, to come around. Maybe you're here this morning and and you're not saved. You've never trusted Christ. Maybe you've trusted in a baptism, a a membership or a good life. If all that would have worked, we would have never needed the gospel. Jesus is the only way. And if you're here this morning and the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart, you know what you need to do. And do it today. Be saved today. Leave this building if you don't know Christ. Knowing Him as Lord and Savior of your life. And quit having to do this and having to do that and count it a blessing to be able to do anything for our Savior and our Lord.